when we found out that we had spherical aberration and there was really not much or, or anything we could do about it, uh, it was initial shock, disbelief, and then in some cases, sadness, uh, certainly embarrassment for everybody involved, uh, public embarrassment in particular, because the telescope had gotten so much attention and uh, within the public and the press. Some people who were involved became very angry and, and left the project. Uh, others uh, decided that the, the dream of Hubble was still a very worthwhile objective, and we should uh, continue to pursue that dream and try to, to solve the problem and, and get back into the operation we had expected originally for the telescope. And I mean, solving the problem, you know, to me sounds like, a, I mean, it is a re or it was a real triumph over adversity and, you know, almost, um, uh, you know, like a film, <laughs> an adventure film of, 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 you know, coming up with a plan and then going into, you know, into space and, and, and pulling it off. Um, it must have been an incredible amount of work. Um, how, how was it done and, and, and who did it? Well, uh, there are sort of two parts to the story. There's a formal part. Uh, of course, NASA wanted very badly to know what had gone wrong and could we characterize the problem, how badly uh, aberrated was the telescope. Um, and so a couple of different uh, independent review boards were appointed with optical experts and engineering experts to go off and sort of do a forensic analysis of, of this problem and come back and tell us what went wrong and why did it go wrong. The other part, the part of the story I most like, and I, you know, I love this part actually, and I tell it in my book, is kind of the informal part of the, of the situation. Um, the early images that came down, uh, we launched in uh, April of, of 1990, and just within May, just within four to six weeks, we had images uh, well, we had images down even earlier than that, and, and the teams were going off and looking at them four to six weeks later. But just a few days after the first images came down, uh, John Trauger, who is an astronomer working on a second generation instrument for Hubble called Wide Field Planetary Camera Number 2, uh, was sitting in his office in, in uh, Pasadena, and in walked Hayden and Marjorie Minel. The Minels are very respected, revered um, figures in the world of astronomy and astronomical optics. And Aidan Minel founded the Kitt Peak, or one is, was one of the founders of the Kitt Peak National Observatory. And Aidan said, John, could I see these very early images that were taken uh, with the Whitefield planetary camera, the first version of the camera, uh, you know, a few days ago on Hubble. And so John brought those images up on the screen and Aidan sort of looked for a few seconds and said, hmm, You've got spherical aberration. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> just just by casual inspection, <laughs> and then uh, a couple of weeks later, uh, both Aiden and John Trager were at a conference of optical experts in Southern California, and they had gone to the evening meal, a buffet, and they were standing in line. And um, uh, Aiden said, "You remember those?" And, and they were next to each other, actually, in the food line. And Aiden said to John, "You recall those images you showed me?" And I said, "It had spherical aberration." He said, "You know, don't you have mirrors within your instrument at a very particular place?" And John said, "Yes, there's a place called the pupil." And uh, John said, "Sure." And Aiden said, "Well, you ought to be able to fix the problem by just correctly figuring the the little mirrors." Of, size of a, a U.S. nickel, the little, just correctly figure those mirrors and they can exactly compensate for the spherical aberration. So the camera won't even know it had a spherically aberrated telescope image coming in to the, into it. And um, so John thought, wow, that's a thought. And he went back to Pasadena to JPL and spent several days with an optics engineer at JPL going through different scenarios. And they found that by all means, they could make this correction in that camera. And, and that word got back to NASA. John brought it back to, to, uh, to Greenbelt here at the Goddard Space Flight Center at a meeting of our science working group. And, and so that took care of like 50% of Hubble science program. If we could make that correction, put it in John's second generation wide field camera, and launch that as early as possible back up to Hubble and replace the original Whitefield planetary camera with John Trauger's version, then that would correct 
uh, our workhorse camera and give us about 50% of our science uh, uh, objectives. But what about the other 50%? So uh, Riccardo Giacconi at that time was the head of the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore. The Institute was responsible for planning the science program for the telescope. And he was quite upset um, that only 50% of the science was going to be restored and not 100%. <laughs> so he commissioned a separate team to, uh, with NASA's blessing to go off and look at how would you solve the entire problem, not just the problem in the Whitefield Planetary Camera. And so uh, some two brilliant engineers, Jim Crocker, who worked at the Space Telescope Science Institute, and a man named Merck Bottema, a Dutch optical physicist who worked for Ball Aerospace in, in Colorado, um, came up, and I won't go into the details here, read my book, uh, but they came up with um, an ingenious scheme for inserting another device into the telescope, the back of the telescope, replacing one of the four science instruments that were back there. Uh, this device was called COSTAR, Corrective Optics Space Telescope Axial Replacement. <laughs> they, they call it COSTAR. And it basically had an arm that came out of the top of the instrument and inserted pairs of mirrors in the optical beam for each individual instrument. So there were four there, an instrument was taken out, replaced with COSTAR, that left three science instruments in COSTAR in the very back end of the telescope. And, and the, the informal part of this was the scheme for the, the arm um, coming out of the top of the, of the COSTAR instrument and, and putting these pairs of mirrors in the optical beam of the telescope so they would correct spherical aberration came to Crocker in a shower in Germany at a meeting of this committee. And he noticed the European style showers, the head would slide up and down on a, on a pole. Oh yeah. We've got and one of those. Could, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you can actually, you can actually tip and tilt the head in various directions. And he said, well, let's just do that inside Hubble. Let's have a pole, you know, extend out into the optical beam of the telescope. And we'll have these pairs of mirrors on the pole and they can tip and tilt to, to correctly align with the telescope's optics. And, um, and voila, we have a solution for three of additional scientific instruments. <laughs> and so, you know, there were formal studies and, and, and detailed reports written and very detailed new specifications written about what the telescope turned out actually to be in orbit as opposed to what it was intended to be when it was ground on the, the mirrors were ground on, on Earth. Um, but there's, I love the informal stories about how creative people are very, very smart and experienced people, both, in fact, at the same time, um, could actually have these brilliant ideas just sort of off the cuff that, um, that led to a solution to the problem and, and saving NASA's bacon. <laughs> <laughs> 